Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead on Sunday morning? Stay tuned to Bible Line and find out. Welcome to Bible Line Ministries with Bible prophecy expert, radio talk show host, and pastor, Dr. Hank Lindstrom. Over the next half hour, enjoy as Dr. Lindstrom takes you on a journey through the scriptures. Now, Dr. Hank Lindstrom. I'm Dr. Hank Lindstrom. I'm your host, and we're going to be talking about the scriptures. And so, if your Bible's nearby, get it, and you'll be able to turn to the passages we'll be turning to. You might also want to get paper and pencil and jot down some of these references. Look them up again later in your Bible and see for yourself that the things we'll be talking about are right there in your Bible. Also, you're going to get a chance to look at my Bible as we look at the scriptures and uh, talk about the things that are uh, uh, connected with this particular topic. You know, a lot of times we hear things that are not true. For example, at this time of year, we hear about Ash Wednesday. We hear about Lent. We hear about Good Friday. Well, guess what? There is no Ash Wednesday in the Bible. There is no Lent in your Bible. There might be Lent. If you shake it, Lent might fall out, but no Lent, L-E-N-T. It's all pagan. And the Good Friday crucifixion is a myth. Christ really was crucified on Wednesday. There's no possible way you could get three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday. Think about it. Christ had to have been crucified on Wednesday of that week, and that can be demonstrated. But again, we get taught things that are not even true. Lent is a false pagan celebration that can be found or traced back to all the way to Genesis chapter 10. That is, uh, Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, had a supposedly virgin-born son named Tammuz. That system of Semiramis and her son became a mother-son cult that is around today. And wherever it went, the names changed, but the system remained the same. In uh, Italy... The woman was Venus, the child was Cupid. In Greece, the woman was Aphrodite, the child was Eros. In Egypt, the woman was Isis, and the child was Horus. And in Israel, it was Astaroth being the mother and Baal being the son. Same system. And by the way, Astaroth, the short form is Ishtar, the English form is Easter. That's the mother of Baal. I don't celebrate Easter. I celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ again from the dead. You know, at this time of year, I think we ought to dump the E word and substitute it with the R word. The R word being the resurrection. That's powerful. and allows us an opportunity to witness to our faith in Jesus Christ. Easter witnesses to a pagan sex goddess, and that's why... We have bunny rabbits and eggs, speaking of sex and fertility, at the time when we should be celebrating and focusing on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Nobody seems to want to speak up because they don't want to rock the boat. Nobody wants to talk about traditions that are false. But Lent is false. Ash Wednesday is false. Good Friday is false. And so many things connected with the... uh, celebration of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection have uh, been polluted and uh, altered and are false and, I believe, need to be rejected. Somebody needs to say, get rid of it. And let's focus in on the real story, the story of Jesus going to the cross, dying for you and me, I believe on Wednesday, being placed in the grave by sundown, and then 72 hours later, coming out of the grave at sundown. We're going to turn to a passage in Matthew, and this is an exciting passage, and it has to do with uh, Jesus. And notice, he actually connects himself to one of the most difficult-to-believe stories in all the Bible. 
the story of Jonah. A lot of people believe Jonah was a mythological story. And if Jonah is a myth, then Christ is a myth. Let's take a look. In verse 40 of Matthew chapter 12, it says, As Jonah was, notice, three days and three nights. That's 72 hours. It should read, in the fish's belly. The Greek word here is not whale, but the King James translators translated it whale. It says here, he was three days and three nights in the fish's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus Christ really links his credibility to the story that seems to be most difficult to believe, the story of Jonah. Well, the story of Jonah is true, or the story of Christ is not true. Because Jesus says, as Jonah was, so shall the Son of Man be. So if Jonah's a myth, then Christ is a myth. But obviously the story of Jonah is a true story, and Jonah actually is a perfect picture of Christ and enacted out the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. And we find that uh, if you read the story carefully in the book of Jonah, uh, Jonah actually died in the fish's belly. And the fish's belly was a picture of the tomb of Christ. And that after three days and three nights, Jonah was resurrected from the dead and left the uh, belly of the fish. And as Christ was dead for three days and three nights and left the tomb, came out of the tomb 72 hours after he had been crucified. What a great verse. Write it down someplace. Matthew 12, 40. As Jonah, so is Christ. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, if Christ was placed in the grave at sundown, and he was, then he must rise at sundown, 72 hours later. Think about it. Christ had to rise at sundown. In my church, we may be the only church in America doing it, we have a sundown service every year because we believe Christ rose at sundown. And if you read the Bible accounts, on Sunday morning, they didn't even come expecting a resurrection. They came expecting to find a body. They came with spices and ointments in order to finish the hurried burial that had occurred that afternoon when Christ died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and had to be hurriedly prepared for burial and placed in the grave by 6 p.m. as the Passover began on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. And 72 hours later, Christ rose Saturday at 6 p.m. when the Passover, rather the Sabbath ended, and that was the beginning of the first day of the week. And in the morning, Sunday morning, the discovery was made of an empty tomb. It's interesting that uh, this confusion reigns because people aren't paying close attention to the Bible. It would seem everybody ought to get this thing right. But it's amazing how tradition keeps people blinded. And nobody wants to question the tradition. And so people say, because they hear wrongly that Christ was crucified on Friday, that it was only part of Friday and part of Saturday and part of Sunday, and that was three days and three nights. That is really a cop-out. That is not true. Jesus said, and if you take the Bible to be literal, and I believe it should be taken literally, he said he'd be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's 72 hours. And so Christ could not have been crucified on Friday. So the Good Friday story is a myth. And Christ had to have been crucified on Wednesday. And so that week was, when Christ was crucified, was Good Wednesday. And Friday was just plain Friday. And Christ rose at sundown, not Sunday morning, as so many teach. You know, if you keep Christ in the grave till Sunday morning, you violate what Jesus said. 
You keep him in the grave an extra night period. That would mean three days and four nights. Jesus said it would be three days and three nights. So we have the story is pretty plain. But also, we find that Jonah was exactly, or in the fish's belly, exactly three days and three nights. We'll go and take a look at this, and you'll see it in your Bible. And no wonder Christ picked this picture and I think God had arranged this in advance as a beautiful picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ and that he wanted us to see that uh, long before it ever happened as a picture of uh, Jesus uh, being crucified for your sins and mine. Well, here we are back in the book of Jonah and you'll notice in Jonah chapter 1, in verse 17, it tells us what Christ was referring to in Matthew 12, 40. It says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. Now, this was not a whale. And many people use whale because they think somehow that Jonah stayed alive. And so they're looking for... Uh, whales because they breathe air and they think maybe uh, therefore air was trapped and he could live somehow in the belly of the uh, fish for three days and three nights. But the Lord appeared or rather prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish how long? Three days and three nights. Now do you think this was like part of Friday, part of Saturday and part of Sunday? Like they try to explained away the Good Friday crucifixion in the New Testament. Christ was crucified on Wednesday. And he was a literal three days and three nights, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish's belly. There's no reason for us to believe that that wasn't a full 72 hours. And it was. And by the way, Jonah, according to this passage, died. Notice it says in verse 5, the waters compass me about even to the soul. Wow. The depth closed round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. Then it says in verse 6, and the only way this could happen is to die. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. Now the earth's crust varies in depth between 8 to 12 miles. And so the bottoms of the mountains are at least 12 miles down into the earth. And then it says, the earth with her bars was about me forever. So notice he's enclosed in the heart of the earth, just like Christ said he'd be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And then we have the resurrection of Jonah. It says, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So Jonah went down into the very heart of the earth, and the earth with her bars was about me forever. In other words, he could not have possibly gotten out of this place which in the Bible is described as a prison. Did you know in the heart of the earth there's a place called in the Hebrew Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, and in the Greek Hades, and there's a hollow place there in the heart of the earth where all of the dead went before Christ died. And we find that the lost were in a place of fire and torment, and the saved were in a place of comfort and they were separated by an impassable gulf so that the two could not cross over to where one another was. Luke 16, Jesus pulls back the curtain on the unseen world, and in verse 19 till the end of the chapter, he talks about two men who die, a rich man that was an unbeliever, and he finds himself in flame and torment in the heart of the earth. And then a beggar named Lazarus dies, and he finds himself in a place of comfort in the heart of the earth. They can actually see and communicate across this impassable gulf, but they can't travel from one place to the other. The rich man is still there, but that beggar named Lazarus, along with all of the Old Testament believers, are now no longer in the heart of the earth. As Christ went down there, as he tells us in Luke 23, 43, he tells the dying thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He already had said in Matthew 12, 40, that it'd be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So paradise was in the heart of the earth. And we read that in Luke 16, 19 to the end of the chapter. 
And so what Christ did is he announced liberty, victory, to the people that were waiting in the heart of the earth and took them out of the heart of the earth, took them up to heaven. And now paradise, according to the Bible in 2 Corinthians 12, 3, is in heaven itself. So what we learn here is that Jesus was exactly 72 hours in the heart of the earth. And he, on the third day, emptied out paradise and took it up to heaven. That's why this side of the cross, the Bible tells us that when a person dies, they're absent from the body, present with the Lord, if you're a believer. If you were a believer in the Old Testament, you would be absent from the body, present in Sheol or Hades, in a place called paradise that was in the heart of the earth. That's where in Luke 16 you have the beggar named Lazarus going and that's where the dying thief went and met Christ in the heart of the earth. But Jesus, when he rose from the dead, took all of those believers up to heaven. There are numerous passages that discuss this and yet it's amazing. Preachers oftentimes are ignorant of this and never preach it and you never hear about it. But where did Christ go? Well, he certainly didn't go to hell. The Apostles' Creed is wrong. The Apostles' Creed said that he died and then he descended into hell. Not true. Christ went to paradise. Read the Bible, Luke 23, 43. He told the dying thief, Today thou shalt be with me in hell. No, he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then we learn in Matthew twelve forty that it would be in the heart of the earth. So we know that paradise was in the heart of the earth, but now it's no longer there. He has taken all the believers up to heaven. My friend, if you were to die right now, where would you go? Well, according to the Bible, you could be assured of going to heaven, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, present with the Lord, if you're a believer. Now, in order to go to heaven when you die, you must trust Jesus Christ as the one who died for you. When he went to the cross, Jesus was paying for your sins and mine. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I had been raised in church, but it wasn't until I was 18 that I actually understood John 3.16 for the first time that God loved me and he loves you. That he gave his only begotten Son to die for you and for me, that whosoever, any of us that would believe or trust in Christ, that we would not perish because He perished in our place, but we would have everlasting life. My friend, right now, do you have eternal life? If you don't, you could have it by simply trusting Christ right now. Whisper a prayer between you and the living God. Just tell Him, God, I'm a sinner. I don't understand a lot, but what I've heard on this program, that makes sense, and I believe Christ died for me. I believe he shed his blood to pay for my sin debt in full. I believe he was buried. I believe he came back from the dead. I trust him right now to save me, to give me the gift of eternal life, to forgive my sin and to take me to heaven. The moment you trust him, God knows and he saves you. Eternal life is a present possession. Even John 3.16 makes it clear that you would not perish but have have as a present tense verb, everlasting life. So you would possess everlasting life at the moment of belief. That means you'd have it tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, a million years from now. Trust Christ as Savior and you can be absolutely assured of going to heaven. Boy, when I heard that for the first time, uh, my ears just uh, perked up and uh, I said to myself, this is great news because my church had pretty much convinced me at the time I was a high school senior that I was headed for hell. And when I saw what the Bible said that I could receive eternal life as a gift, it was the best news I ever heard. I have a lot of resources here at Bible Line that we'd like to share with you. I have CDs of my teachings, 10 or 12 hours of teaching on a particular topic, the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, many others. We have DVDs, video presentations on different topics that you can use for teaching and learning. We also have many books and Bibles and things, but also you could give a gift to BibleLine and help BibleLine stay on the air. Call our 800 number and our operators will send you a resource sheet or will tell you how 
you can get some of these wonderful resources that we have. Let me introduce to you some of the resources that we have in our Bible Line Resource Center that I think will be a real blessing to you. We have DVD presentations of our television programs, which each one covers a particular doctrine that you can use for your personal study and enlightenment on that doctrine. Plus, we have CD series of 10 or 12 hours of teaching each that will greatly aid you in studying books like the book of Revelation or Daniel and many others. About 40 different series are available. Plus, we have this wonderful evangelism uh, series or set here, which is uh, the free ticket tracks, 500 tracks, plus this book that actually tells you how to talk to an atheist, an agnostic, a cult member, a family member, and lead them to Christ. For a minimum gift of $20, you can get these uh, tracks and the evangelism handbook. Also, we have the Strong's Concordance. This is a marvelous tool for studying your Bible because it gives you every word in the entire Bible and by a number code system, the original Hebrew or Greek word from which it came and what it means. It's wonderful for Bible study. For a gift, a minimum gift of $30, uh, we can ship this uh, to you and it will help Bible Line uh, to stay on the air. Also, in addition to the Strong's Concordance, we have the Bible that I like so much, the uh, Schofield Reference Bible. This is called the King James Study Bible, but it, the notes are by Dr. C.I. Schofield. It first came out in 1909, and the notes are really great because they are uh, geared to the Bible questions you might have relating to doctrine and uh, issues that you'll be facing when you're... Uh, uh, learning and then talking to others about the Bible. Don't miss out on these wonderful offers. You can go to our website and see them online and order on our online bookstore by going to BibleLineMinistries.org or .com. And you can also call our operators and they'll be glad to assist you in uh, reviewing whatever products you've seen here, resources you've seen, and maybe you'd like to order them directly over the uh, telephone. Just go ahead and call our operators. They're standing by and they'll be able to help you. And you can also give a gift to help Bible Line uh, to stay on the air in your area. In any case, we're very concerned about where you'd spend eternity. And if you have been uncertain or you have doubts, maybe you've never really understood what the Bible says. The Bible makes it very clear that we're all sinners. Every one of us are deserving of hell. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And Christ went to the cross of Calvary, taking your sins and mine upon Himself, paying for our sin debt in full by His death and shed blood, such that all of our sins, past, present, and future, were paid for in their entirety. The hymn writer said it so well when he said, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it as white as snow. When you trust in the finished work of Christ at Calvary, God then gives you the gift of everlasting life because He fully purchased it because He paid for every sin that you and I would ever commit, past, present, and future. And at the moment you believe, you receive everlasting life and therefore you'll have it forever. It's not temporary life or probation that God offers, but it's everlasting life. And if you have it right now, as the Bible teaches, it's a present possession. You'll have it tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now. You'll have it forever and ever and ever. So you can be certain of going to heaven from the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. And if you've never done that, just whisper a prayer between you and the living God and tell Him, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And we all are. But I believe Jesus Christ paid for those sins in full by His death, burial, and resurrection. And I trust Him right now to save me, to forgive me, to give me the gift of everlasting life. And the moment you trust Christ, God saves you. I did that when I was 18. A year later, I made a second decision to serve Christ. And that's where rewards and blessings and joy comes in. And so you might be a believer, but then if you are, you need to make a second choice 
where you serve the Lord. You see, rewards are attained by our works and our deeds, and they're a future attainment because rewards are not given out until after we have died. But if you are a believer at the moment of belief, you receive everlasting life and can be assured of heaven. But then the Bible says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, which come about by living for Christ. And I believe some of our resources will really help you in uh, growing and knowing what the Bible says in these areas. You might find out what teaching sets that we have on DVD and video and CD in audio teachings that will help you grow and really become a dynamic witness for Jesus Christ. But if you've never trusted Christ, just whisper that prayer between you and the living God and tell Him, God, I admit that I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus Christ died and paid for those sins in full by His death and shed blood. I trust Jesus Christ right now to forgive my sins, to give me the gift of eternal life, to be my Savior, to be my only hope of heaven, and God will save you. Then you need to make a second decision that will bring about rewards and blessings in your life now and in eternity that come about by our faithful service. But our uh, salvation is never in jeopardy. It is not based upon our works. And once you trust Christ, we have the promise in John 6, 37, that Christ said he would in no wise cast out anyone that has come to him. And he says that he would not lose one that has come to him in John 6, 39. I hope you'll take a look at our website, BibleLineMinistries.org or .com, and also write down the phone number on the screen and call our 800 number, and our operators will be able to help you uh, be able to find our website or maybe order some of the resources we've talked about or maybe explain to you how you can be sure of going to heaven if you have doubts or confusion about what is required to get you into heaven. I'm Dr. Ang Lindstrom, and I hope you enjoyed Bible Line, and I hope you'll tune us in each and every week, and also to know that on the Internet, you can tune in our radio program 24-7, and I hope you'll take advantage. God bless you. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next week right here on Bible Line. Watching Bible Line, a presentation of Bible Line Ministries of Tampa, Florida. Your donation to Bible Line makes it possible for this ministry to continue. Bible Line's address is 4811 George Road, Tampa, Florida 33634. To order from Bible Line, call our toll free number at 1 800 576 3771. That's 1 800 576 3771. Or visit Bible Line online at BibleLineMinistries.com or .org. Be sure to watch next week for another edition of Bible Line from Calvary Community Church in Tampa, Florida.